Ensign Boimler loves doing the mission log. Ensign Mariner hates working the recruitment booth. And Ensign Rutherford loves pears. Or does he? <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Today we're doing a review of Star Trek Lower Decks Season 3, Episode 5, entitled Reflections, written by Mike McMahon. We have a very special guest. What a coincidence. <laughs> showrunner extraordinaire mike mcmahon hey guys thank you for having me i love being with people who are reviewing an episode i wrote and produced i hope you liked it <laughs> bad oh, yeah. news oh no ah! no we loved the <laughs> hell out of it uh everybody at home we already kind of started talking about it before we recorded so we had to hurry up and hit record so that we don't lose <laughs> any more of this good stuff uh how you guys doing I'm doing great. great. Yeah. yeah. I, I love this episode. I thought it was just, it was packed with a bunch of stuff. Oh, um, so much. And and you're so good, uh, Mike, at just like plugging in so many original things. The one thing that jumped out at, at me this episode was the graffiti on the side of the Sequoia. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of, I, I know it's a small yeah. thing, but I don't know. You kind of do these things to like just, you know, references to popular culture and things that you see in your everyday life. And you put those things in in Star Trek. And I love those references. It's a small detail, but it's just it's so poignant to me. So I thank you for those kinds of details. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I think that it's, um, you know, stuff like that is like it's all about what makes it feel like a lived in world for these these lower deckers. Right. And like they're not even really repairing this, that, that shuttle. Anymore. <laughs> now they're just like learning yeah. on it, seeing what, like it's kind of covered in Rutherford's experiments, like <laughs> they're drawing on it. Like somebody drew teeth on the front of it at one point, you know, like I, I love yeah. getting things like that that feel like maybe Tom Paris would have been into that. You know what I mean? Like mm. getting some Star Trek sort of stuff in there we haven't seen before. I'm glad you like that. We yeah, also got, it's, it's, speaking of Tom Paris, a Tom yes. Paris non-appearance <laughs> mention. We on this show like to cover all of the non-appearance mentions because, you know, people's story continues, even if they're not on the show per se, if they're being yeah. talked about, their story continues. And uh, Tom Paris was mentioned, uh, oh my God, we had so many, uh, Tom Paris, Kirk, Spock, yeah. uh, the EMH doctor, we had the Grand Negus which I'm saying is wrong. <laughs> it's got to be I wrong. I think that's a pretty good guess. I think that's a good guess. Yeah. Yeah, and this episode also, Mike, had my favorite line, I think, in the history of uh, all of the Star Treks now. And that was when the conspiracy truthers yes. popped up <laughs> at the Starfleet booth. And that's another thing you did, by the way, that's so awesome. The, the little Starfleet recruitment booth, you know, that's that's another brilliant. It's a small thing, but it's just a brilliant idea. It's a play on, you know, military recruitment booths and those kinds of setups you see at malls and stuff. And I just think that's that's another level of just small detail and paying attention to expanding the universe and bringing mm -hmm. the level of comedy you do. So kudos to you for that. But my favorite line when the conspiracy truthers came up was, hey, Starfleet. When are we going to hear the truth about this? Yes. <laughs> they don't buy it. They don't buy it. I didn't see, yeah. they didn't see it happen. <laughs> oh, that was, he was like, yeah, right. And uh, Mariner's he's, like, he's in the, what are you talking he, about? Uh, he's, on the, he's working on the Celestial Temple, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, all right. <laughs> sure. worked on. And really that's happened. another, that's, that, that was so funny to me because it, it's, you know, that you get all these uh, conspiracy theories, the JFK assassination, all of this stuff, but people start to question what happened, you know, yeah. and this and that. And, you know, with Cisco, that's one of the kind of mysteries out there. It's like, well, you know, what happened to Cisco? And I just like that you address it and you kind of hit it head on with the joke with the whole conspiracy truthers. I love I love that. Mm. Yeah, they're, uh, I'm glad you like that. And, you know, these conspiracy truthers, maybe they were talking to somebody who saw more of a season one Deep Space Nine. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We've seen all of Deep Space Nine. So we know we have the inside scoop. You know I mean? <laughs> exactly. No, it's great, great, uh, you know, just references all throughout. Even the Tom Paris Voyager references. It was like, you know, you're, you're talking about the other shows in a yeah. way where it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're really paying homage in a, in a, 
in a respectful and kind of classy way, com- comedic, but just, I, I love it. And that, that just shows to me, the audience, that you have this background. We talked about um, a little bit when we met each other uh, about how you watch episodes of Star Trek and how you're, you know, you're a fan. And I think that really shines through the work when you see the results. It's funny. I don't even consider myself to be like a super fan. Like I, right. cause like my, the way my brain works, like I've seen every episode of Star Trek at least a couple times, you know, some more than others. And <laughs> I think like, to me, Star Trek is, you know, people have said like, it's like a place, you know what I mean? And, mm. you know, I grew up in Chicago and I would go to second city for, to see a comedy show. Right. And there was always like, there were always things that played if you were from Chicago, right? And I'm writing Lower Decks in a way that's like the viewer is from Star Trek. Like they've yes. seen it all. They've experienced it all. And like, I get, like I see interviews with myself where I'm like, I'm getting Deep Space Nine like episode titles wrong or like I get a start date <laughs> wrong or, you know, I forget the order of some stuff and like, like I'm always forgetting like stuff that happened and like which movie happened, which which event in the movie happened when, and like you know, like there's people who know every. I mean, you've encountered yeah. these people yeah. who are like encyclopedic, and that's that's yeah. their love language with Star Trek. Like they found a thing that the canon is what's for sale. You know, like they like that it's careful. And for me, I like that about Star Trek too. But like, or Star Trek as well. I do like Star Trek too. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I think that like the thing that I like, the thing that really speaks to me is I just want to tell stories that exist in the world of Star Trek, where all of these shows are things that you, that you, uh, that I, since I know other people have seen it, it's a shared history with us, even if it's a television history that like, you know, it's the same thing where if you make your friends laugh, joking about a thing that happened to you growing up, like Space Nine happened to us when we were growing up, you know? And so doing that but making it but making it still fit in with canon and not break the rules i have so many funny conversations about like okay this line is funny but you know <laughs> i have like four other people that are making sure that i'm not like breaking a thing from star trek you know yeah um, the fans will let you hear it if you do you know you know how the should. fans are they there should. but yeah. a couple quick things number 1 i i, I do want to talk about you're you're more than just a casual fan. I mean, you guys cram so many Easter eggs in here, and that's just to my eyes. I know I saw the Alan Moraine guy. Oh, I know. Yeah. I think I saw <laughs> the Vulcan contraption from Gambit Part Two. Yeah. If I remember, yeah. I don't know if that was it, but I'm gonna have to like Google and make sure there's that's what it was. A lot of stuff. My eyes caught things. that, <laughs> and there's stuff that got cut from those. T- like they were oh, used to be gosh. like, like guys, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> But but you did you did kind of jump over something real quick when you said uh, you've seen some episodes more than others. Real quick, what is the episode you've seen the most? Oh wow! Um, I mean probably Lower Decks because that was my favorite episode. <laughs> yes, and then yes, and then I rewatched it with all the writers, and I kind of like go back to it. But like you know that originally. Like when I went in to pitch the show, I was like, well, obviously I'll never get a Star Trek show, you know, like, so I, there's no pressure in this because it's just never going to happen. I'm not that lucky. And, and nobody's foolish enough to, to, <laughs> to trust me with one. They, and, they, they uh, made the right choice. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I was just, well, thank you, man. And like, so that one a lot, inner light a lot. Um, I like, I think I've probably seen, cause you restart all the time. Like, I've probably seen the first half of season three of TNG like way more than everything else, just because I'll be like, well, time to start that again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you skip the first two seasons. I get it. I don't, I don't skip them, but like I jump to mm. my favorites sometimes when I want to put stuff <laughs> on in the background while I'm working. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I also jump to like, there's some like, I love the Doctor and Voyager. I mean, you know, you brother for, or uh, Boindler's calling it out in this episode, but like, you know, I, there's a there's a part of me that's like I would have done an entire EMH show like just I love the hologram right stuff and I love his journey in that show and you know that's so I'll, I'll jump to some favorite EMH episodes and I love Bob Picardo's uh, uh, performance in that so I don't know I, I I and I think like you know I to me the definition of a super fan is somebody who like they have everything exactly right 
And I hire a lot of super fans. Like Brad Winters is a super fan, you know, my producer on the show. And like, I'll have conversations with him where he's like, uh, I don't know if we can do that, you know? And I'm like, well, what if I said it was like this, you know, like we had a lot of conversations when we stripped the hall first season. I really wanted to do that, you know? And, and I was like, but we got to get it right. Like it has to make sense, you know? And the first time I told him about it, he was like, that's stupid. Like, that's yeah. not, that doesn't make any sense. And I was like, well, 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 hold on. I was like, there's an enterprise episode where they're taking hall plating off. And he was like, mm-hmm. all right, all right. And then we talked, you know, like, and I think that like, those kind of those kind of fans have an equal place at the table as the me kind of fans because I'm there to spend time with my friends in a world that I wish we all lived in, you know. And so, imbuing a comedy with that, like it's this is Seinfeld except Starfleet officers and it's a ship instead of Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? Like, yeah, and that's a worthy thing to do as long as you're as you're as you're honoring like what you guys were saying, like what came before, but also the spirit of all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the spirit. I mean, hey, Trill, how sp- you know how far do those <laughs> spots? You know, th- that's like an, everybody wonders about those Trill spots. I mean, that's the first thing that you know y- you think when you see it. Um, so I just love those kind of honest jokes. And but that's why question. you know he's a bad guy, right? Because somebody might <laughs> yes, think that. but him yeah. to just shout it out, you're like, ooh, I do not like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, that's just too much. We too only much. have like <laughs> one second to tell you. Like the amount of screen time with that character to tell the audience that he's bad, that we don't like this version of this character, you yes. know, and you get it done pretty quick. He says the Cerritos sucks, and then he is especially explicit. <laughs> That's all and it takes. To a woman you that he is, not. Uh, yeah. works with. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> terrible, terrible. Uh, I did have a question while I was watching this episode because I know a little bit about what directors do um, for for live action filming stuff, but. I really don't have a clue about what directors do um, in animation. And maybe you could tell the audience a little bit about what what, what they do. Uh, sure. There's actually a couple different directors. So um, we have kind of, a, 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 when you see directed by on an animated episode, that person is drawing. They draw stuff, you know, okay. like they're not behind okay. a camera. Um, and so... The director of any animated episode usually has a team of board artists who who you see those black and white storyboard kind of animatics like okay. they'll have a team of artists. They'll get the script and they will they'll make a rough approximation of the episode in black and white. And then the, it takes one artist to kind of combine it all into the vision of what that episode sort of feels like, you know, and right. then there's a supervising director over the entire series who all the directors of each episode kind of go to, to make sure that each episode doesn't feel totally different from what the look of the show and the feel of the show is. And it's amazing to see these directors go in and like, you know, you need some complicated acting done in a scene and they literally like, we'll be, we'll be editing it. And they're like, well, I'm going to lower this character's eyes, eyelids just a little bit more so you can tell that they're, they're suspicious, you know? And like, Mm. (laughs) you have all this like very tight control. And then, you know, uh, there's three of us really that, that voice direct, you know, when you're in the, when you're in the voice acting booth, right. It's me, mm-hmm. uh, Kayla Pavia or Brad Winters. Usually Chris Kula did it as well for a while. And, um, you know, we're just trying to get as many options in the edit as we can. So that like, you know, the artists have a radio play to work off. of. So like, like Sirach, if I was directing you, I'd be like, I'd be like, let's, let's say you were playing Jake Cisco, right. I'd be like, okay, let's run the scene back and forth and we'll record the audio doing it. So then we have like a baseline and then I'll be like, okay, this line, when you do it, give me three of this one where heighten how pissed you are. Cause I'm not sure how pissed I want you to be, but <laughs> okay. of it, get more pissed, you know? And then like at the end of it, I, I usually ask for two things. I'd be like, okay, pretend I'm the world's worst director. Give me a take that you wish I had asked for that. Mm. Like yeah. that I missed, you know? And then the last one is usually, um, because because sometimes it's like not even if you've played the role for a long time, but sometimes like I have a blind spot and and you know a performer will give me something where I'm like, yeah, that's better than I would have thought of because you're a whole other artist that's working, right? right. Uh, thinking about it. Um, but then other times I'm like, now we've done the Lord X version. Give me the Deep Space Nine. Like you're on set. Don't worry about it being an animated show. Don't worry about being funny. Give me Jake Cisco on set. How would you perform this? you know, for Ira or for whoever was there. You know what I mean? And then we get interesting choices there too. We're like, at the last minute, I'll be like, wait, 
take that, speed it up slightly. That's it, you know. And then we have this <laughs> this bank of stuff we take, and then we listen to all the audio and we stitch it all together. And it's like, you know, it's all these different directors kind of together. Does that? That's probably the longest answer in the world for what you're asking. But that that is. No, it's a clear picture. And yeah. actually you mentioned something I had no idea about, which is the speed of the audio, um, slowing and speeding up audio and delivery. That's, that's pretty amazing uh, to know uh, the kind of work that goes behind the scenes to make all of this stuff, you know, click because right, right. It, you have it animators like, on one side, the writers on this side. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it amazing. It seems like you're, you're rewriting it as you're going like you know we all know that like editors can also kind of rewrite a movie or an episode or something in, in the edit but you're actually kind of talking about rewriting in a way you know like the tone or the delivery or kind of right. the emotion of the scene it's got to yeah. be a really fun and creative process and by the way it all is. of our fans when you said if i were directing you they all heard when i'm directing you i'm just telling you <laughs> that's what our fans heard I would love that. I think Sirach and I have to sit down and talk about where is Jake Sisko in, you know, in the era of this show and like, what's, what do people think they want to see? And then what are we actually going to show? You know what I mean? Like that's, um, but the, uh, yeah, it is, it's very collaborative. I think that there's a healthy amount of here's the plan. We're going to stick to it, but always be open to finding something that's better than the plan. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. art does not necessarily have to be, structured i mean it can be right but i think that like when you're making a comedy like this and when you want to feel like this is a thing you want to hang out with people in the show like this is a this is a doors open if you've seen one episode zero episodes or 800 episodes of star trek like yeah we're here and we love this and we love you and we want to have a good time like you it's hard to like always predict that and have that calculated like little mess ups and flubs and emotional breaks and like you know, like when Boimler's having his like screaming, like the amount of times I made Jack Quaid scream that scene <laughs> where I was like, all right, do each individual line. Now, don't even wait for me. Just run through three pages of it without any direction. And now do it like you're insane. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> And you find these like great little moments where like improv comes in. Sometimes it's exactly sticking to the script, but like not thinking that you know exactly what it's going to be until you you feel it you know what i mean like it's 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 weird like you i'm sure you guys have experienced too is like collaborating with a bunch of people on a tv show is like it's like everybody being like instinctively we're all going to know when this is right and when we all find it everybody's like that's it that's it that's you know it. and it's a great feeling i and we have great people working on lower decks because like they're all huge fans of it and of star trek and are like when that instinct hits you know you've got it like there's a moment in this episode that made me tear up when I was watching it and I wrote it, you know what I mean? And I was talking <laughs> to my producer today and he's like, that still makes me tear up is when Rutherford is like, yeah, I put my friends in here too. And like, there's this yes. swelling of music and you're like, oh, it's, it's like, I know it's coming better than anybody. And, and, and I did it on purpose and it still makes me go like, oh, I love that moment, you know? And it's cause we, the instinct was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a heart heartwarming moment too. I, I I do recall that, and just the whole like, you know, when you doing the um, location filming essentially on your on your animation, obviously, and my my guess is that increases the budget. Is that is that it accurate? Does, yeah. Like, yeah, that's why you see in like most like the Simpsons starts mostly in the house. You know what I mean? Like, or a school or mm -hmm. or Family Guy does the same thing. Like the more reuse then the fewer times the artists have to like create entirely new environments. But then, mm -hmm. you know, when I was on Rick and Morty, we like, I remember at the very beginning of the show, we claimed that like we were going to make a couple dimensions and go back there all the time. And then it was like, <laughs> by the end of the first season, like we never went back to the same. It was like very rare to ever do that. And the board, like the background teams, like they just, the design, like as long as you get ahead of it, like they do amazing work, you know, and it's, it takes a lot of work. It's more than like, you know, Wile E. Coyote running through the same desert environment, which I love. I love those cartoons and they look amazing, but like, you know, <laughs> Star Trek doesn't often go back to the same place. Like the ship is the mm -hmm. home base or the, or the space station, you know what I mean? Like, and, and when you change it up, like that does feel exploratory in a way. So yeah, we have a lot of, we have a lot of backgrounds and a lot of conversations about like, 
what's this alien race? How do they look Star Trek? How do they look like an animated show? Like, you know, there, a lot of work goes into this show. You know, uh, I've said it. Yeah. No, no, sorry. No, ahead, I've, sorry. Said, I, I've said it before. And um, I, I just think this show is, is just so superbly produced and well executed that I think, you know, like I've told you before, and I'll keep saying it again and again, I believe this will be the longest running Star Trek show <laughs> you ever. Keep- Cursing me with that. You keep I, I, cursing I, I, me. That's not a curse. I, 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 my this is the son of the true, emissary. Like, this is not yes. a curse. This is I know, a blessing. I know. But you know what, dude? <laughs> if we run for too long, they'll never let me make a movie. You know? uh, oh. I, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I mean, Simpsons <clears throat> made a movie. There's, they ran for a pretty oh, yeah, long that's time. that's true. All right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, where's the Deep Space uh, Nine movie? When are we getting but, that? But, but we got to shoot for the video game. I, I you know, let's shoot for I the know, video right? game too. Yeah, we have an I'm iOS the... game. You know what I want? I want a bunch of little action figures that I can watch my kids going. That's beep, beep, beep. that was my yes. question. Too. I was going to ask you about the action figures. Yes, I know. I'm always that. begging for action figures. They just put out a uh, a Spock wearing oven mitts from Wrath of Khan, and I was like, <laughs> I don't have a Spock. Put out a Tendi. I don't. I don't need Spock. I look. I love Spock with the uh, oven mitts. But like, come on, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, maybe someday. I think like if it goes by the usual Star Trek timeline, in thirty years I'll have a movie <laughs> uh, action figures. Mm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh we do have to run to a break. Uh we are gonna take that break in just a second. Uh but before we do, Mike, you are such a busy, busy, busy man. And we really appreciate you taking the time and we really value your time. We know, you know, how full your schedule is. So thank you very much for us and for our fans and for the Star Trek fans for always being so gracious and trying to squeeze us in. Uh, we really appreciate you. Well, this is not my first time on Seventh Rule. I'm always happy to come back. You know, I love you guys. I love how much you love the show. I love how much you love all of Star Trek. And, mm. uh, you know, thank you for thank you. Thank you for watching with open heart and and, and being so generous to me as well. Like, I, I love you guys, too. And, and you know, I'm always keep, happy to come keep- back. Keep the jokes coming, man. We're we're loving it. We're soaking it all up. <laughs> mm. I'll keep oh. the jokes coming no matter what. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> and, and on and on a timing note, by the way, uh, yesterday was a three year anniversary of our brother Aaron Eisenberg passing, and it just kind of popped in my head that I think he would have loved the out of this show. Uh, he was, I know. I but feel yes. like he would, and I, you know, I wish you two would have had the chance to met to to have met. But uh, I wish so too. I, I feel like every time, yeah, when 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 I re- when I heard of his passing, I was just so like because we had just started Lower Decks, mm. and it like I was like, oh, I'm I'm gonna meet him and I'm gonna work with him and I'm gonna and then it was like because like I love I love that character and I, I and I could tell that he was like that he had like a real brightness to him that like everybody loved him. I just kept hearing so many stories. And then, it, like, it felt like I knew him, which I know is like you guys really did, and like you were friends, and like, but like Star Trek brings us all together. That that mm. that I really felt that, and I, I wish I could have met him. So condolences, you guys. I can't believe it's been three years. That's wild. Mm. Well, he had a very good sense of humor, much like yourself, and that's one thing that I'm sure you guys would have clicked on, just exactly. you know, joking and laughing together. So, uh, uh, but thank, but thank you for embodying his spirit and making us all laugh and giving us some great entertainment. Um, it's just you're just really carrying the mantle for Star Trek, and they made a very good decision by picking you to to make this show happen. So, kudos you, to to the guys I, at uh, Paramount. And I have to jump, but I do want to say, having met Sirak in person at Star Trek Day, I do think it has to be said. The guy is so tall. You don't realize <laughs> he's so freaking tall. Yeah. And then he's so tall and he still wears a tall hat. Yes. And you're just yeah. the whole time, you're like, wow, it's really nice to meet you. Uh, they must have jacked that second level up of the promenade on these space, like a couple extra inches. It's like, yes. I can't believe uh, yeah. your feet were just kicking the ground on the front. You're so tall, yeah. dude. I had no now idea. Now you know why we were always sitting down on the promenade because they couldn't get they couldn't yeah. get us in the same There's shot. No you and Aaron, I can't. You'd be like, do we have to? Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Well, all right. Thank uh, you guys. It was a joy being here. Well, we're gonna take Thanks our break uh, very quickly, and we're gonna Sorok and I are gonna argue about which lower decks character corresponds to which Seinfeld character. Uh, I think <laughs> I know. I think I got it. But thank, thank you very good. much, Mike McMahon. Everybody at home, thank you. Stick around. We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. 
Mike McMahon has left the building. He's like Santa Claus where he like shows up and all our eyes light up and then he like <laughs> leaves and we're all just like, oh, you know, I just saw there. We were like in the afterglow of his positive and fun presence. Um, yeah. Super amazing quick, guy. Oh my gosh. Can't get enough of that guy. Um, so real quick, here are the trivioids for today. The Cerritos is back at Tolgana 4. Ensign Tendi signed up for Starfleet at the recruitment booth. Uh, Rutherford keeps dreaming about Kirk and Spock, but, you know, who doesn't, right? Uh, Starbase 80 <laughs> is the worst. Tendi has a pod plant from Omicron SETI 3. Petra Aberdeen served on the victory. Rutherford loves pears, theoretically. Uh, the mission log is Boimler's favorite part. Okay, so we have so much to talk about first of all we've said in the past that these dudes and and i feel like same thing with him joining our show i feel like we have a thousand questions that we want to cram into 25 minutes just like they have a thousand bits of information <laughs> yeah. that they successfully cram into 25 minutes my notes on this 25 minute show are longer than my notes for an hour long show yeah. And it's like a blink and, and you miss. I don't know how. I just don't know how they do it. And, and he was talking about cutting stuff. So I know. Like, I, I want to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I kind of want to. He's got to put together, uh, a, a, you know, outtakes or some kind of special where they just show us the stuff that they cut. Because I know there's got to be just so many references and jokes that hit the cutting room floor so it's yeah, it's amazing yeah. they're just they're just loading it up it's an overload i did want to ask him too and i you know maybe it's best left unasked but you know everything he says like triggers another question in my little nerd heart you know and one of the things was i wanted to kind of know like what what what's the time like above any other like the joke or the reference that he was so positive the star trek fans are going to like you know what i mean like when they're writing it they're like oh they'll like this or will they like that but you know there there had to be a few times where they're like oh my god i got an idea <laughs> and the star trek fans are going to love this one you know like what was the one you know and who knows maybe it was a, a Jordy bear or a data shampoo bottle or a okay so there were so many. Uh, what was it? Didn't O'Brien have a statue in season one? Yes. Yeah, that I, was see, pretty, that's I, pretty high up. That's got to be up there. Yeah, it's you're, right. Be up there. <laughs> you're right. Oopsie doodle. Uh, Jeepers <laughs> creepers. So, OK, there were so many references in this. Oh, oh uh, one other one. Just badgy. He had a badgy behind him in the background. So he must have thought this badgy thing is going to work. Right. See, I would have thought that 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 it was like a mixed room, you know, like some people are like, they're going to love it. And other people <laughs> in there are like, I don't know. Does it seem a little too edgy? And they're like, no, Trek fans can take it. I don't know though. They like inner light. That's not very edgy. That's like their favorite ever. And when he said lower decks was probably the episode he watches the most. Yeah. It's one of my all time favorite episodes. We reference yeah. it all the time. Star Trek fans, like, you know, the, the Star Trek fans of Star Trek fans, I feel like really love that episode. Uh, can't yeah. wait for you to see it someday. So here are just some of the, the references. Do you remember the Alan Moraine guy in, in the first yeah, season yeah. of Deep Space yeah. Nine, Move Along Home? They yeah. were there. Like when she said, I tried, to forget, I tried to forget him. <laughs> oh, never forget. Never forget. This is the greatest moment in Star Trek history. Uh. <laughs> when she said, all you guys do is trap people in games. I think I don't remember what the race was called, but that was that move along home Alan Moraine guy from the first season where Avery Brooks looks like he's questioning taking this job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, he told me many times in public and private how much he hated that. Uh, he, he thought he looked foolish and. I believe he's accurate <laughs> because he didn't like to do that whole little hopscotch kind of dance. And they were thing doing in. this and yeah. Uh, he thought it was foolish. And I agree with him that it was foolish. Um, That's the emissary, but, man. <laughs> you know, even takes stuff seriously and that kind of stuff is like, it was just too, that was right on the border where he was probably thinking I'm, 
I'm going to walk. Forget this. I'm not doing this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm a hawk, bro. You don't make hawk do hawk yeah. scotch. Uh, <laughs> there, there are so many. I mean, I'm sure there are a bunch that we're missing, and we'll check on those in a minute. But just a few of the things, you know, like the Alamorain one was great. There were so many cool aliens in that little marketplace or whatever that was that they were doing. There was a Vorgon. Now, a Vorgon, it was from a Next Generation episode where Picard goes to Ryza. I think it might be Captain's Holiday, but there were a couple of them, so it might not be. And I think Max Grudenchik plays the bad guy Ferengi in that episode. I might be mixing two episodes because there were two kind of episodes where he goes down there. But a Vorgon was like this alien, and I and I saw him there. There were two of them. They're like time travelers or something. There was also these fish head aliens. They might be called Antedians. Right now, all the nerds are going crazy. They're like, get your facts straight. I don't remember. <laughs> I think I think that's what they were. But they're fish head guys. And I think that's the fish head alien that Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac was in. Like, I think that's what it was. He wanted to be in a Star Trek thing. So they're like, all right, put on this fish head suit or whatever. <laughs> there was also a Lorian, you know, the, the Morn alien. But it actually yeah. looked like it might have been Morn, not just a Morn alien because it was wearing the, the same outfit that Morn wears. There was a Telluride, of course, that was really funny uh, when she was trying to make him a transporter guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Morn, Morn does voiceover work. He, <laughs> he, he, I, I heard him throughout the episode. I don't know. You heard it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that Morn can't shut him up. Then, then there was this thing, and I mentioned it when Mike was here. One of my favorite Star Trek episodes, and people always look at me funny when I say it, so this makes me feel so validated that this was in here, was a two-parter. I think it was in the seventh season of Next Generation. It was called Gambit 1 and 2, and I really liked it because it had the best scene ever in Star Trek history to me when when Data is reprimanding Worf, and then they have this reconciliation, and I swear to goodness, it is the cutest moment in all of Star Trek history. Anyway... The second the second part of that had like this Vulcan mind weapon. And I'm pretty sure that's what what I saw on the table there. And I, when I mentioned it to Mike, he nodded. So that's good enough for me. Forgot what it's called. <laughs> that's good enough for me. Yeah, you had to get confirmation that that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, I, I liked. Uh, well, the, did we see that trail before? Was she? Was she yeah. in that episode before? Yeah, but not this season, possibly. That was Ensign Barnes. And yeah, she had like a thing with Rutherford, you know, in a couple episodes. Um, and, you know, it's kind of creating this little love triangle with Rutherford and Tendy. Like, are Tendi. Rutherford and Tendy best friends? Or is there a little more? And then there's this girl, Ensign Barnes. Uh, so oh, yeah. Oh, times. now I remember. Yeah, yeah. she got Tendy was getting jealous of her um yeah um this is by the way this is uh a, a very quickly a little still shot of gambit here picard look at this guy and this guy's name was like <laughs> Ner narian or Nef nefruf i don't know something narin man know. he looks like an actor that i've seen before could be anyway what were you saying yeah. sorry um no i was Gonna say something about the uh, the baby bear scene. I, I kind of like that one <laughs> when yeah. Shax comes in there and he says, uh, "Hey, baby bear." <laughs> you know, yeah, there were a lot of moments that were really sweet, like the one that Mike mentioned when he brought his friends with him in his brain. And I remember yeah. thinking, like, yeah, that that works. You, you know, the other guy has the impetuousness of youth and the the his advantage is his edginess his willingness to do whatever rutherford has the wisdom in in understanding that you know he's got his friends with him and he's learned a lot and i was like not only is that a nice moment but it also works logically you know like yeah. it it worked for my for my brain it worked and i'm usually hypercritical about like well that's cute but technically speaking you know but i was like it works yeah i loved it and even Rutherford, at some point during the episode, said, "Hey, why don't we just uh, coexist and live together?" You know, like he's like, "Cause you know, why does one of us have to go?" You know, he was trying to find yeah. some kind of clear resolution. You know, that didn't involve them 
uh, whacking each other. But I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, well, also the Grand Nagus reference. That was, that was another just like yeah. cool reference in this episode. I wanted it so bad to be Rom. I'm sh- pretty sure it is, but they didn't say it. But I wanted it so badly to be Rom. So I actually rewound and checked the staff to see if the staff <laughs> head looked like Rom or just a generic <laughs> Ferengi. But yeah. But that was a cool concept, just the idea of, oh, this artifact was taken from its rightful owner, you know, and because those kinds of things happen with uh, countries uh, claiming museums are having their national artifacts and they petition yeah. to get those things returned to them. And oftentimes they are. Right. Um but it's a great, it was just a small little storyline, but it, it was pretty cool. This kind of rogue, she kind of reminded me of Kira when she was a, a revolutionary fighter a little bit, you know? I just like that you said the word rogue right now. When I'm looking at the top of Rogue's head on your shirt, I know that's her head. I see that white stripe on her head. I know that's <laughs> oh, yeah. up there she is. Yeah. Everybody listening in, Sorak is wearing an awesome X-Men shirt, and it's very distracting because I love the X-Men. <laughs> yeah, I- I do too. I have a whole collection of those comics back in the days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I wanted to ask you, this is the question. Um, were they making a section 31 reference in this episode? I should have asked Mike about that because it felt like the Rutherford stuff was section 31. I think here are my two theories. Theory number one I think if you asked Mike McMahon that question, he would give an indirect answer. I, yeah. He would give a, uh, he would, his eyes would be twinkling with, I yeah. want to tell you everything, but his mouth yeah. would be saying, I can't tell you any, you know. Because uh, uh, that was my, I was, my brain was racing when I saw those, that yeah. whole like erase your mind and cover up and all this. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the second theory, uh, you know, like, we did get a glimpse of that at the end of, was it season two or the end of season mm-hmm. one? I remember we saw it. It was kind of like a little miniature, tiny little cliffhanger hint. And my first thought was, was that section 31? Uh, and, and I, you know, so it could be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. That's just how, you know, we like to work. We like to try to connect everything. And, yeah. and when they're, yeah. The show has built its own curse of making so many references now that we automatically think everything is a reference. <laughs> yeah, We're like, oh, that's got to be this. But yeah. it absolutely could be. Um, it could be something else. They didn't else, say but, it wasn't, right? They didn't right. exclude it. Okay. It could be any, at, at this point, it can be anything. You know, we want it to be Section 31 or something equally badass. And we know we're going to be very happy in season 13 when they finally reveal this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah uh, that's the beauty too. I, I wanted to mention also to Mike was that it feels like there's no limit to where they can, what they can do with these characters. Like, totally. you know, that when you, you know, when you watch deep space nine, you know, okay, you know, this is going to wrap up with the dominion. And it, there's kind of a, a horizon to to look at where you say, okay, that's the end. The end is over there somewhere. It's kind of, you know, implied and you see it you, as you gradually walk up to it. In this case, while I'm watching these episodes, I don't see it like uh, yep. an end point. It looks like it can just, they can just keep going Sky's on. Sky's the limit. Yeah. They can, yeah. they can do, they, they've, the way that they've chosen to basically do anything. You know, like they've made the pack leads the big bad. Okay. You know, they've made Star Trek laugh at itself. They've made grumpy Star Trek fans going, oh, comedy, you know, into like super fans. So I, I agree. Like, I think that they can just do whatever they want. They can follow the lower deckers all the way to captaincy. I doubt they would. Um, they can follow the lower deckers splitting off into different ships. They did that, you know, a little bit before. You know, they can they can connect with other series. They can even do big monumental reveals of, you know, the Cisco returning to Bajor. Like, who knows? Or they could just make it like like you mentioned Seinfeld, which is just a show where I think Larry David said that the two rules in Seinfeld was they said, uh, no hugging 
and no learning. As in, they didn't want any growth in the show. They wanted them to stay there. They don't want them to learn their lesson. They don't want them to be sorry about something or, you know, and they want to stay there. So maybe the nature of this lower deck show is mm. that if they become commanders or captains, then it's not lower decks anymore, or maybe they will. And so they've, they've opened our minds to be completely open to any possible direction they want to take it, I think. Yeah, and I like that idea of the no hugging, no learning, because you kind of see a little element of that. The characters are set in their ways. They're not, you know, Mariner's going to jump off, do whatever she wants to do, and, and nobody could tell her anything, you know? <laughs> uh, Boimler's always going to be the nerdy guy who's always, you know, uh, geeking out over somebody or something. And so they've, they, they're not, they're unapologetically themselves, mm. you know? And, and to me, that's, that was what Seinfeld was too with those characters. They were just, you know, yeah. I, I bust through your door when I want to and I, do, I go into your fridge. That's unapologetically, that's just what I do, uh, you know? And there's other characters, you know, each one of them had their thing and their, their niche. And I feel like watching this show, I'm, I'm getting to know these characters. Like I, I know Rutherford, and I feel like I, I know Rutherford. And it's crazy yeah. because they have grown on me and and the stories are just interesting. So the show flies by when you watch it. It's like, oh, you gotta you gotta really pay attention because it's flying by. You know, when you're saying you know Rutherford, I was just thinking like if they were real people, would Rutherford be the the my favorite guy? Like I feel like Boimler, yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to be around him. I'd just be like, dude, bro, you're you're stressing me out. And Tendy, I would, she would be my favorite human or Orion in the whole galaxy. <laughs> but I don't think she'd like me. I think she'd be like, bro, you know, I just, I, I, I don't care. Your jokes don't land with me. I'm, I'm going to go hang out with Rutherford. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, I wonder, would, would Rutherford be just like the most chill? He'd be like, yeah, sure. Let's go eat potato chips and sit at a bus station. Yeah, I think Jake would be hanging out with <laughs> with Rutherford because <laughs> he's the coolest one. Otherwise, he'd be just it'd be too much, you know. Mm -hmm. I think he's he gets into just enough trouble, like scientific trouble. He doesn't get into like you know he gets into the nerd trouble that I like to get into, yeah. which is you know let's study the uh, schematics on this ship and da 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 da. You know, oh how fun. <laughs> <laughs> and whereas Mariner would get us to do stuff where every day we'd be like, how did I let her convince me to do? So I keep telling myself, don't <laughs> do the shit that she tells me to do. Well, if I want to have a good time and be have an exciting adventure, she definitely would be the person to, to hang out yeah. with. Uh, but if you want to just have a chill kind of watch football Sunday, it's going to be rough. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Nobody to wants to hang out with Boimler unless he's handing out free raisins. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, finish up on this episode. Um, captain's uh, Yacht. They mentioned the Captain's Yacht. Uh, that was also in Star Trek Next Generation. I think it was in one of the movies was the first time. I also, real quick, when, what's his name? When Rutherford was talking with himself and they were like in basically like a sea of white. It reminded me, everything reminds me of something. It reminded me of Tapestry, the Next Generation episode Tapestry, where my cool green shirt, my my blue shirt, uh, Captain Picard or, or Lieutenant Junior Grade Picard came yeah. from when he was talking with Q in the episode Tapestry. Um, right. Obviously, they and they also mentioned the Devron races. Devron system, I think, was in uh the last episode all good things of next generation they were they were going to the devron system where the anomaly was uh so there are just so many there was the little data dolls um oh there was also the guy with like a face ring and a head ring i don't know if you saw that uh and he was no, with, just... yeah he had like a big ring on his face and on his head it was pretty nutty um <laughs> I do like though the 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 British accented archaeologist lady where at the end yeah. Mariner saves the you know what what they say save contact so maybe we'll see her again hopefully 
Yeah, she was she was a, a breath a breath of fresh air. I, I always every time I hear that accent, I think of Eve England. So <laughs> I, I instantly thought of Eve when I heard the voice. But um, the she's thing the I one cool. British person that you put you put her face yeah. on everything. Now you're like a oh, British person. It's Eve. <laughs> no, there's a certain tone there. Yeah. That, it's, that is similar, you know, um, Laon has it as well. But um, the uh, cutout of Spock and Kirk, you mentioned it earlier with, with Mike, you know, the, the Nam. Yep. But I thought the whole cutout where, you know, you put your face there, the kind of stuff that you see at a yeah. carnival, or, you know, that was classic. Right Such there. great little details. They think of all yes. these little details yes. and they're like, what would be. You know what it is? It's this they, they get these slice of life details that no other Star Trek series does because nobody would do. Star Trek is about doing these big things, you know, and this right. is about the little slice of life. You know, it's like the the dream you had and and the little poster board cutout thing that you have in the corner where you're doing <laughs> yeah. this job that you don't like. Like it's freaking adorable. <laughs> I caught myself laughing when Rutherford uh, woke up from his nightmare in the opening scene and the guy's walking by with like a little towel wrapped around. And when he wakes up, it, he almost drops his towel. He's yeah. like, whoa. Just, <laughs> that, just some rando that, dude. Some <laughs> rando dude walking around with his little towel wrapped around like he's at the, you know, in the, in the spa. And I just thought that was hilarious. It's just a small moment, but, you know, they... <laughs> This show makes me laugh, and um, if you if you don't, I mean, if you don't laugh, if you're trying to take it serious and say, hey, "Well, that's not uh, that's California class," but then you're really not paying attention. You know, it's this thing is just literally built to just let you get back in your comfort zone and not yeah. take things seriously. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It just puts you in a relaxed state of mind right away. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm totally one of those guys too. I'm always like, well. If they're in a California class, you know, but it's like with this, I'm like, this show yeah. is too good for me to do that. I'm like, well, yeah, just enjoy it, you know, and I'm constantly yeah. pausing and rewinding to catch all me the too. little nerdy things. Uh, speaking of nerdy things, we've got a few things that our good buddy Don Crandall pointed out. He said the animated series Kirk and Spock with the filmation designs made yet another cameo as standees at the Starfleet recruitment booth minus their faces. Right. That's what you're just talking about. He yeah, says, was yep. that one of Morn's species or the actual Morn who walked by the booth? That's the Lurian that sure looked a lot like Morn. Uh, and and you're right. They could have hired Morn to do the voiceover for his own character, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> for all we know. Um, oh, Mariner. All, yeah, this is a good one. Mariner said, discover the undiscovered country, which is an in-joke for the film Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country. Yeah, I caught that. That was a good one. Yeah, the pod plant from Omicron SETI three is from the original series uh, episode called "This Side of Paradise." Uh, oh, so so yes, I remember that because uh, when we yeah. did the cruise, I remember watching some of the old uh, original series episodes that were playing on yeah. you know constant streaming on on the cruise. But so I just happened to catch that episode, and really? the thing that the thing that I you know noticed and observed was that they used the word omicron which is you know it's a it's an alphabet letter but still it's uh you know now it means something different <laughs> when you hear it right? well the reason i'm saying omicron is because they pronounced it omicron but there's like a video out there where it shows all the different times that the word omicron was in a star trek episode and how everybody pronounces it differently it's like Omicron, <laughs> Omicron, 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 Omicron. And it just keeps going back and forth. And it's, like, it's been mentioned like 20 times by different people in different series. And they all say it differently. And not one person's like said, no, this is the one way to always do it. So that's why I made a note. I'm like, say Omicron, because that's what they called it. Um, <clears throat> there was a, oh, he also mentioned the captain's yacht. Yeah, Star Trek Insurrection was the movie, and the ship was called the Cousteau, you know, from Shaq Cousteau. That's cool. Oh, this guy. I totally recognize this guy, but I didn't know from what. Uh, let me pull him up here. Uh, we saw this guy in this episode, right? And I was like, what's this guy from? And uh, Don Crandall tells us that he is an Arcturian. Um, 
One of the conspiracy theorists was an Arcturian, an ultra rare alien species only seen in live action once in Star Trek, the motion picture. That's 1979. Um, and then he's got an old picture of 1979 uh, movie. Oh, he had an old action figure of him. That's pretty cool. And, <laughs> Even oh, he got an action figure. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, they like they like their stuff. The alien from the Collector's Guild was either the same species or even the same character, Toph, from TNG's The Most Toys. Yes, see, this was the guy. This was the guy with the ring in his face and his head. Next to Data, see? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got holes in his damn head. Um, so there, this was one of those episodes where there were just so many things. Uh, Rutherford was wearing the racing uniform that Tom Paris and Harry Kim wore in Voyager's episode Drive. Good knowledge there. Um, the Wrath of Khan fans will appreciate the remember joke with the hand in place on the face for a mind meld. Um, they finally addressed why there are so many conflicting uniforms in the franchise. The California class starships have the uniforms seen in lower decks, but not all classes use them right. They said uh, Star Trek's always changing their uniforms, right? They they address that, you know, like because everybody's yeah. like, they we do ask, we're like, why do they keep changing their uniforms? So that's just kind of <laughs> them saying, hey, we just do it, whatever. Yeah. Um, anyway, lots of good stuff from Don Crandall. Any uh, final thoughts on this episode? I feel like we could talk about it forever. Yeah, we can, but uh, I do have the final thought. The um, name of Rutherford's evil twins ship was. Well, Rutherford's was the Delta Flyer. Yeah, Sampagita. What is that? It is a flower, which is essentially the species of jasmine. So it is a species of jasmine known as Arabian jasmine. Cool. I just thought it was interesting that somebody would use that word. I was like, what the hell is that? I You never yeah. hear that. So Yeah, you had so, to, you're uh, like, you think it's got to mean something, right? It's got to mean something. And, I, yeah. and that would be another thing to ask Mike, like, why the hell would you, you know, why the hell did you use San Paquita as the name of a ship? And what did it mean to you? Or, you know, where's the source of that information, or that inspiration? Mm -hmm. All right. And I know as soon as we end this recording, there are going to be like five more things that we remember we wanted to talk about. <laughs> the, this thing was packed, chock full. <laughs> Excuse me. And I just know people are going to jump on me about the fish head aliens and the Mick Fleetwood stuff and all there. But I think I'm right about that. I'm pretty sure. Let us know in the comments yeah. below. And also just another shout out to all the voice actors doing this. You know, I, I, I really think that uh, they're, they're doing an exceptional job from, you know, all of the people on this cast, their chemistry is so good. Um, and they've really sold sold us on their characters. So uh, they're doing a tremendous job, these voice actors. Yep, I agree, A+. Plus. Um, and speaking of tremendous jobs and great chemistry, we'd like to give a very special thanks to Homer Frizzell out in Walter Koenig's former apartment building in New York, Dr. <laughs> Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, the aforementioned. Doc <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, everybody's Eve England. Uh, Yvette Blackman, Tom Carmen, aka Skillet, Skillet. Timothy Baum, aka Grandpa One, aka Bubbles, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill <laughs> Victor Arukin, uh, Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, John Mann, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Rex A. Wood, Anil O. Palat. Erica Strom, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, Radek Orshevsky out in Southwest Poland, Poland. Henry Unger, my live from Tokyo out in Tokyo. And of course, <laughs> everybody knows and loves Dr. Susan. V. Gruner. Gruner. What a great one. Can't wait for the second half of the season. All right, everybody, that's it for us. Thank you all very much. And we will see you next week. Until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>